a very interesting set of remarks, problems, solutions. So now I turn to our panel, and uh, if they allow, I will take the alphabetic order as well. Uh, each of you are suggested to react in not more than five minutes to what you have heard. Do you agree? Do you disagree? On which point? What additional comment would you like to make? Uh, or any other topic, but within five minutes. So I start with Inge Bernhardt, please. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much to the organizers for having me here on this panel. It is, of course, a challenge for me after my president, uh, Barroso, has made yesterday evening a warm plea for the single market and how it can contribute to economic recovery. And after my director general this morning has indicated how the single energy market contributes not only to economic recovery but also to sustainable energy use to still give you an added value and new ideas in my five minutes intervention. But let me still try to do so. I would like to pick up two concepts that have come up in a different context in the debate yesterday. And the first one is President Barroso's concept of implementation. The second point that I would like to raise came up yesterday when Mark Leonard asked a question in the context of a common foreign policy. Is there a sufficient common purpose? Those are two points which I think are very relevant to describe the state of the union in energy markets in Europe today as well. On the point of implementation, if we look around in Europe to the different member states and check what is happening in reality and compare that to what the rules say, I think we have to observe that there is a significant gap. And that also when it comes to internal energy market legislation, implementation is lagging behind. If I just look at the transposition of the third package, then I see that more than a year after the expiry date of transposition, almost half of member states have not fully transposed those directives yet. And if I look at the, third pack the second package legislation from 2006, I still see that on basic principles like transparency by the TSOs, the necessary publication of objective data, we still have plenty of outstanding disputes. So if we want to complete the internal energy market by 2014, I think that we need to move from the rules to the reality, and as President Barroso said yesterday, just do it. My second point is about the question whether there is a sufficient common sense of purpose. And here I am a little bit more optimistic because if I look around the industry today, then I see that, for example, when it comes to our TSOs, our network operators, after the unbundling concept is taking form, you do see a common sense of purpose more and more amongst our TSOs. That is happening through industrial trends, consolidation of our TSOs, but also thanks to the European networks of TSOs that the third package has created. And we'll hear later today uh, representatives talking about the effects. Whereas before, our network operators were listening to the supply arms to see which investment decisions they would be taking, they now develop 10-year network development plans that look at Europe as a whole. They now start to work out network codes which are not just applicable in one jurisdiction but which apply throughout Europe. And I think those elements will really make a substantial difference between now and 2014. Likewise on the institutional front, if we look at the national regulators, more and more our market becomes European through market coupling and other factors and regulators obviously need to follow this trend. From an institution that existed before where national regulators were cooperating and exchanging best practices, we now have an agency in Ljubljana 
and Alberto Potocnik, it's as director, which truly develops European regulation and where our national regulators do not just exchange best practices, but also actually take decisions and take those decisions by majority voting when they have to. And also this makes a substantial difference to what we had under the first and the second package. Now, when it comes to the common sense of purpose, there are also reasons to be more worried. And in particular, if I think about the electricity sector and the fact that the sentiment amongst populations and politicians about issues such as the energy mix are so different between countries. If you take Poland and Germany, for example, or Austria and France, that this inevitably disrupts the common sense of purpose that we have within Europe. So what I see as the main challenge in completing the end zone in the market by 2013 is to deal with this question. How can we make sure that where our member states have to intervene in markets in order to achieve the objectives that their population wants in terms of energy mix, that they do so still in a coordinated way, taking into account the impact of their actions in neighboring states and trying to intervene only where it's really necessary so that their intervention is meant to make markets work and not to replace the positive effect of markets on a lasting basis. I see my time is up, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next intervention is uh, uh, president Guido Berto Bortoni, uh, president of the Autorità. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. First of all, my warmest thanks to, to the organizer for inviting uh, the Italian Regulator Authority to participate in this panel. So I have, uh, let's say, two preparated or, let's say, well-prepared uh, intervention or messages and one reaction to what we heard from previous uh, speaker. The goal of completing the internal energy market by 2014 is certainly a challenging one, but we believe that the integration of energy markets is a fundamental step in the progressive development of European Union. So, as uh, Mr. Mandil said, a prerequisite for economic growth of the Union. In my address, as the Italian Regulator Authority, I will be focused I will be focusing on the electricity and gas sector and a few insights, just the two ideas. Electricity. The past year, Italy has witnessed a significant changes in the technological composition of our generation portfolio with an impressive growth in power production by renewable energy sources and photovoltaics in particular as well as wind power. These are profound changes involving the integration of non-programmable renewable sources and the effects of these changes emerged gradually in Italy at first before growing to become very deep for the market, especially since the fourth quarter of 2011, last year. Considering the trends in the wholesale market prices, IPEX, the Italian market in particular, it appears that the growth in production of non-programmable renewable sources has caused an important change in the fundamentals underlying the very functioning of the electricity market in Italy. In October, November last year, the most significant effect manifested itself as a sharp increase in hourly prices on the day ahead market in the evening hours, let's say five, since 5 to 9 p.m. That is the time slots when the photovoltaic production, which currently involves nearly 400,000 plants, more than 13 gigawatt installed, is gradually diminishing. The prices for the evening hours in IPEX during the fourth quarter of uh, last year 
had a 30% increase relative to the same period of the previous year. These elements, which might seem like details specific to the Italian situation, are being brought to your attention because the current market design, both nationally and on European scale, was originally conceived with a more traditional generation portfolio. This design, however, will need to be reconceived in consideration of the large sky scale deployment of non-programmable and renewable, renewable sources. So we support ideas uh, we heard from Professor Newberry to identify the best measure for adapting the market design, what we have as market design, to the new needs in support of the European-wide integration of renewable sources, as foreseen for the achievement of the 2000 targets, as well as for the, for the beyond targets, let's say 2050. As uh, the Italian regulator, we are working also in cooperation with our EU colleagues within CR, CR to, be, to progress in this field, as well as within the ACER working group in order to think about these uh, profound changes and uh, to find uh, suitable solutions. Gas sector. As for the gas sector, I just have uh, one uh, uh, message to you, is to introduce appropriate levels of competition and efficiency to the market in compliance, of course, with security of supply criteria. In the gas sector, even more than in the electricity sector, Europe as a whole represents the most fitting spatial dimension, dimension for characterizing this context. This is, in that terms, this is so for the time being because the commodity is highly concentrated in the hands of very few producers often outside European jurisdiction, and the consequent need to frame the supply infrastructure as a supranational function. Of course, this is the actual, the current uh, scenario we have to cope with. This geographically wide horizon suggests we treat the time frame as being dilated to because the competition in this sector, in gas sector, is running on a long medium and long term time horizons, not much in the short term. The development of infrastructures play a key role in this context and should not be driven by security concerns alone, but also and even more importantly by the proportion of competition. In regard, in regard to our own country, Italy, the cold spell last February drew our attention to the needs, more need, for infra infrastructures. If our country had had more regasifiers, more storage, and a few more pipelines, the impact would have been much more modest. More gas infrastructures entails a broader diversification of sources and routes. More market with more storage, which can also help mitigate negative price effects and greater proximity to other markets. Dear colleague, I, I am sorry your time just, is expired. I'm just concluding with what the reaction you expect. Just uh, one, one, one quick reaction to the words of uh, uh, Director Lowe. Uh, he said um, there is an equation, more market, less regulation. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying this is not, this is not true or ne necessarily true. There are many reasons, one overall. More market means more pluralisms, more risks, 
more need of good rules to minimize risks or to foster the risk management to the better qualified operator. This is, let's say, a touchable reality we have uh, every day. It is not just a reason to survive as a regulator. We believe on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bortoni, and I apologize for interruption. Uh, now, uh, next speaker is uh, Daniel Dobeni uh, Ensoe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Five Chairman. Minutes. And uh, welcome, of course, in this beautiful location. Um, when when you, you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, should, we should think about, is it really useful what we're doing in terms of uh, the energy market? I just uh, had a sentence coming to my mind, maybe because we are in Florence. It's a well-known sentence. If you don't believe in education, just try ignorance. And I could paraphrase that, that if you don't believe in the electricity internal market and in strong interconnected power system for Europe, just try isolated system. And you will immediately see that you don't have the reliability we have today, nor the security of supply. But um, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, for uh, the next years um, with many different reasons. The first one is that uh, as we heard yesterday, Europe has tremendous difficulty to agree on 27. If you're married, you already know that it's difficult sometimes to agree with just two of you. Um, but we agreed on the common market model. And, and we also agreed to implement it by 2014. The 27 head of states, uh, but also all market participants and all market actors. This is already a tremendous step forward. We also agreed that it would be based on market coupling. And uh, to make it happen, we even have a piece of legislation. We have network codes that will become binding. So finally, we have something that may achieve the same kind of rules in the 27 head of states, at least for electricity and gas. But this is not the end of the road. Uh, we still need to, to harmonize or to make compatible. Um, the common market model will be only as good as we have compatible uh, renewable schemes, uh, supports for uh, uh, what we call today capacity uh, generation, reserve generation. I know that talking about harmonizing those subsidy mechanisms is, is uh, very dangerous even today. But we have to face the fact that a common market model works only as good as it is implemented in the different member states, including all subsidy mechanisms. And there, I'm starting to be concerned about um, all the mechanisms that member states are, or some member states are thinking about to promote classical uh, generation. Because once again, by matter of subsidiarity, each and every country that is contemplating capacity markets is going to implement it in a different way. And this is not in line with a common market model. Now, you know that for software, because market rules is the software of our internal market, for software to work correctly, you need a good hardware. And hardware is generation and transmission. Uh, transmission, we need capacity. We talk about that for the last 15 years. Uh, we just, as an association, put uh, on the website the 10-year network development plan for 2012, 2022, so the next 10 years. And, and I was used to talk about uh, the number of kilometers of lines or cables we have to build or refurbish. I would, I would like to look at it in a different way. What we ask for is not that much is increasing the existing transmission grid by 1.3% a year during the next 10 years. That's not that much. We are going to replace 30% of the generation, mostly by renewables not located where the existing plants are. So 1.3% a year is not that much. Is it going to cost a lot for the society? For residential customers, it will mean 1%, less than 1% increase in the electricity bill. 
And Professor Newberry just showed that providing you have good market coupling, FTRs, and capacity, there are tremendous savings to do in terms of pricing for some member states. So uh, we should not forget that this also brings other advantages, this 1.3% increase in grid in the next 10 years. We will meet the rest target. We will save 170 uh, megatons of CO2. So there are many advantages. So the question is, why is it not happening? I think Professor, I think, sorry, President uh, Barroso yesterday said it very clearly, is that we need political leaders to endorse the decisions taken in Brussels when they go back to their country. How is it possible, ladies and gentlemen, that everybody agrees that we need to build those transmission lines, but that we still today are facing with systems, procedures in Eastern member states that makes it pretty difficult to build and operate. Still today, we contemplate realization times for grids of high voltage, of course, somewhere around five to 10 years. So we need to endorse the decision taken in Brussels. And there are signals that show that we need to do it now. The cold spell of February, where the system was very stretched. Uh, the increasing redispatching cost, uh, that by definition is a loss for the social welfare. And finally, the lack of generation that is showing to increase in the different member states, as was pointed out but for Italy. And finally, um, just to conclude, even several centuries ago, uh, Florence, in order to conquer Siena, ensured that they were keeping the lights on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. De Beni. Uh, now I give the floor to Juan Perez of Epex. Good morning, all of you. Uh, my warmest congratulations again to uh, the Institute and Professor Glachon. Um, I will, uh, as Mrs. Bernard uh, said, uh, uh, build on the concept of implementation. Um, first, I will uh, try to um, explain to you how uh, the power exchanges uh, and EPEX uh, sees uh, uh, the world from which perspective. And, and to that end, I will quote uh, uh, former Energy Commissioner Mr. Peebalks uh, four years ago, almost day by day at the press conference uh, creating or giving birth to EPEX spot. At that time he said uh, the price in Germany and France uh, actually is the reference price for the rest of Europe. It is of an utmost uh, importance that this reference price comes from a transparent market with sufficient volumes traded and with a sufficient number of actors. I believe, strongly believe, that with proper supervision of the exchange, the price will and should be trusted by all market participants and all political decision makers, myself included. Um, now, the issue is that um, without uh, liquid markets, uh, target models are a bit uh, utopic. Um, liquidity in markets uh, doesn't uh, come only from uh, regulations and from uh, mm, political drivers. It comes as well uh, from uh, listening uh, to the market voices, to the market participants, uh, listening to their needs. Building liquidity is, um, is, a, is a difficult uh, job. That's where uh, the exchanges uh, play a key role. The exchanges are making their uh, contribution uh, alongside uh, DG Energy, the regulators, Acer, NSOE, the TSOs, and the market participants. Uh, we have uh, relentlessly cooperated during uh, the past years. We have uh, a track record everybody uh, knows. Um, However, uh, as Daniel Dobeni said, um, cooperation is not easy. Uh, it, uh, it works. Uh, uh, it can happen, but uh, it is extremely difficult. In, on the uh, power exchanges, we are very different animals from uh, 
regulated monopolies by law to merchant exchanges to exclusively licensed uh, exchanges and in spite of that uh, I am also optimistic that we will, uh, we will deliver and we will implement. We have been uh, created, uh, creative over, over the past years. Uh, we need that, we need innovation because the target models are static uh, and as we speak uh, the market design is already uh, requiring new changes. Uh, renewables uh, are penetrating more and more. Uh, trading and 15 minute uh, contracts is happening more and more. Everything is moving. We need flexibility. We need rules that, that can not only be implemented but also be changed and uh, be uh, um, evolutive. Um, I would like uh, now to give you a, a small concrete example of something which is being implemented. Uh, something which is uh, implementing what we call the Euro for Electricity, which is uh, the coordinated day ahead price formation for Europe. The day ahead market is simply the pillar uh, for, for the European uh, uh, market. It's, uh, it's the pillar for the, uh, for the forward and for the derivatives market and it's very important as well for the balancing market. Um, on the uh, day ahead market there is an initiative, uh, the, uh, a project called the PCR, the Price Coupling of Regions. The PCR, it's uh, the way uh, power exchanges uh, are cooperating in order to deliver the single coordinated matching function which is necessary to implement uh, the 2014 uh, day ahead target model for electricity. Uh, the PCR has been endorsed uh, by regulators, by TSOs, by other uh, stakeholders. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are doing this with a lot of uh, work and dedication by a bunch of key experts. Uh, uh, the design phase of this project is today almost finalized and we are now moving into uh, the final implementation phase. Um, we think today that the delivery of uh, the day ahead uh, European target model by 2014 through the PCR is still achievable. Uh, the final implementation will, however, be very challenging. Uh, those of you who have been involved in market coupling projects uh, in the past know about this. It requires, uh, above all, a very high degree of mutual trust and cooperation spirit between TSOs and power exchanges and their uh, direct regulatory oversight uh, by uh, um, the authorities in the European Commission. Particular. We are a bit concerned that uh, some parties are still trying to introduce concepts in the governance guideline that uh, might conflict with PCR and which have uh, potential to block. And uh, network codes should be limited to, uh, to issues uh, that are relevant to network codes and not interfere with the guideline. Uh, just to conclude in this room, uh, a well-known French person said once that uh, strategy is a simple art that all lies in uh, implementation. Uh, implementation is what power exchanges uh, know uh, best to do, uh, bringing uh, the software, but the software which is uh, liquid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Perez. Now I give the floor to Alberto Potoshnik. Uh, Mr. Potoshnik, I am the feeling, uh, my perception is that uh, Many of the challenges which have been uh, 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 seen during the beginning of this uh, round table are on your shoulders. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning and thanks to the Institute and to Jean-Michel for giving me the opportunity to share some reflection in this quite stunning and inspiring environment. Um, I think it's in the shoulder, on the shoulders of everyone, of most people in this room, because it is a concerted effort, it must be a concerted effort. Um, it's not just the agency, it's not just regulators, it's not just TSOs, it's the industry as a whole that needs to move together. And uh, you know, I, I, I completely agree with uh, Inge Bernatz when she was saying you know, that there it seems to be now uh, sort of clear signs of common purpose. And I would say that uh, this is what has changed over the last few years. Um, I would like, 
um, to focus on, uh, on, on, on three points. Uh, probably I won't have time to, do, to go through all of them, but first is what we're trying to achieve. How would we know that we have achieved what we're supposed to achieve by 2014? The second um, aspect is, has it taken too long or uh, could have been done on a shorter period of time? And then third is what's there for uh, European citizens, because we obviously we always need to uh, uh, remind ourselves that um, if we're doing all this, it's not for the regulators, it's not for the TSOs, it's not for the industry, it's for European consumers. So we should always try to explain and to see our effort in that vision. Now, what are we trying to achieve? I think um, the, the test that I would use to, 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 to check whether we have achieved internal market is what I would call a, sing, a single market paradigm, i.e. we should get to the point where trading, moving energy across borders, across political borders, should be as simple or as difficult as moving or trading energy within borders so that political borders shouldn't mind anymore. And what we need here are obviously two, um, two uh, ingredients. Uh, we need rules, common rules, uh, single rules, and we need infrastructure. And I think um, um, those panelists and speakers that have um, spoke ahead of me have already said that we are going down the route. Uh, on infrastructure, there is now the infrastructure package proposal with uh, um, an attempt of streamlining the um, administrative procedure for developing infrastructure. Now, we don't only need rules and infrastructure, we also need to implement the rules. And this is basically the, the bet that we are taking collectively at the moment. While we are developing the framework islands and network codes, which will set the uh, single rules for Europe, we are also trying to implement them at the same time. It is a challenge um, because uh, there is a risk Obviously, that the rules once implemented, once adopted, would be slightly different from what we are looking at now. But I think it's, it's, it's a challenge worth taking. And the, in my view, also, there is no other way of getting to uh, some results by 2014. Now, has it taken um, too long? Well, I don't know. Uh, my impression is that we had to go through a change of culture. Also, the framework, the background, or the environment has become more and more complex. When the whole process started 20 years ago, there was almost a single objective, which was you know, integrating the market, efficiency, competition. I mean, you can, you know, can see it from different um, uh, angles. Now, we've heard this morning from the di Director General Lowe, the scene is much, co much more complex. We have the challenge of climate change. We have security of supply issues. So we're trying to develop an internal market on a much more complex, uh, in a much more complex framework. And I mean, if I had more time, I can give you a, big, a, a few anecdotes why it, you also need a change in culture. I just give you a couple of, 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 of examples. In 2000, uh, 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 an administrative court in Europe overruled the regulator saying that auctions are not the appropriate method for allocating scarce capacity in a market. Now. Clearly, uh, that was 12 years ago, but that was the prevailing feeling at that time, and not just among administrative judges. And uh, you know, market coupling as a concept was only born in the modern, uh, uh, modern meaning um, nine years ago, on the 17th of March, 2003. That's what the first time this concept came up. So I think it is, um, you know, it, it needs a change of culture. We spent some time in 2006 trying to understand what open market coupling might have meant, and then we realized that after six months that it was just the same concept with a slightly different institutional setting. So um, yes, we could have um, done it more quickly, but I think you know, we shouldn't be sort of wondering whether that was the case or not. Uh, we just need now to put all our effort to try to achieve the goal. And just to conclude, I see two main challenges now. One is for gas to, same, to follow the same path of electricity, i.e. to now to agree on a vision and then start implementing it. And I see recent, I've seen recently good signs from the TSOs on this. And for electricity, 
to complete the implementation of what we have of the common vision that has that was developed uh, recently over the last sort of four or five years, but then also try to understand what the new challenges might mean for that vision. Because I think that the model that the target model or the vision that we have now needs to be still worked on to incorporate the challenges of a more complex um, energy uh, framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Ranzi, I, uh, I think it is uh, quite fortunate that uh, you are the last speaker of the panel because I know your talent for wrapping up <laughs> the debate. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I'm afraid I shall not fulfill your uh, wish. Uh, it's very difficult to wrap up this discussion, and I think it has been a discussion clear enough um, now, I wish to take advantage of this absolutely exceptional conference to raise an issue that is not central to the European energy market, but which is central, in my view, to the responsibilities of Europe and of the European energy industry, and that is the energy divide in the world. Uh, the International Energy Agency estimates that 1.3 billion people in the world have no access to electricity and 2.7 billion people rely on biomass for cooking, contributing to the devastation of the environment and to their own health. And, and to the and, and, and raising uh, a, a danger to their own health. Uh, this is not going to disappear. In the new policy scenario, which is a rather optimistic scenario of the IEA, there will still be one billion people with no access to electricity in year 2030. Uh, although investment uh, for the purpose of reducing this divide is included in this scenario for an amount of $275 billion from today to year 2030. I, I believe that this is something that uh, has to be faced. Uh, I read about uh, a commitment that the European institutions are considering for Europe taking responsibility to provide access to modern forms of energy to half a billion people between now and year 2030. And I hope that this can materialize in specific projects. What I've read about is the institution of a technical assistance facility providing expertise. Uh, I believe that this is something that has to do with the social and political sustainability of our model. And Europe cannot rely, restrict to commiserate itself for the temporary setback in economic growth or for some difficulties in maintaining market shares of European products in the world markets. Uh, there is something uh, that has to be done, and of course this is a primary responsibility of the public institutions, but it would not be correct or effective to appropriate public money and then look for the way of spending it. Uh, shaping feasible projects comes first and that requires the effort of those who have information, knowledge and competence. So I look forward to some joint effort and I 
expect the champions of private initiative to take initiatives and uh, drag the rest of the compound into a more uh, focused effort to face this huge problem uh, which is in the responsibility of a, wealth, uh, of a wealthy area of the world, which is Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ranchi, for uh, adding uh, a question which uh, perhaps was not in the main domain of our uh, roundtable, but which is so essential and so consistent with the spirit of our continent. So I suppose that we will speak again of that uh, during uh, other, uh, other sessions. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have 10 minutes, let us say, uh, let us say, uh, for uh, reactions and questions from the audience. Please raise your hand. I have uh, somebody who wants to speak here. I presume there are some microphones. Uh, fourth, here. Now you have two microphones. Yes. Can you? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Christian Buchel from um, Distribution of France. Um, the question is related to the electricity sector. Uh, market at the end of the day uh, means uh, customer and customers, and uh, largely, very largely, the customers are connected to the distribution uh, operator. Um, renewables and especially the decentralized ones uh, are largely connected, very largely connected to the distribution operators. So the question, I don't know if the question is from Mr. Lower or Mr. Potechin or, or perhaps Mr. Newberry, but um, what, how do you see in, in, in the coming years the role, the business model of the distribution operators in terms of local balancing, in terms of um, of uh, um, metering in terms of, of energy efficiency uh, uh, because I, I'm, in my opinion, uh, the, the hardware, Mr. Dobinet, I think it's a generation, uh, it's transmission, yes, it's also distribution, it's probably also metering and it's the old industry uh, inside the, the smart home. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Who wants to answer, Philippe? Well, I'll, I'll start, but it, it, um, it will give me the opportunity to respond on the issue of the balance between markets and regulation as well. Um, I, th I think that, um, first of all, with respect to the business model of, uh, uh, of DSOs, um, the model surely cannot be as a unique gatekeeper for everything which touches the consumer. <laughs> um, that would be uh, actually a way of frustrating innovation and indeed differentiation of different marketing approaches towards the consumer and, and actually um, preventing, preventing competition taking place in terms of offering the consumer the packages which he, he wants in the, in the way in which he wants them and also uh, that, 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 that a precondition for all that is, is the smartness of the information around the market. Um, at the same time, I don't see personally why any DSO sh should not be able to cooperate as a uh, compete as a competitor for those services either. So um, a model which excludes the DSOs uh, from taking part in the market for energy services and supply of energy seems to be also the wrong way. And I think we, w we need to look for a, a middle way. Um, and this comes back to the, 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 which means everyone should be able to compete, including DSOs. Um, it comes back to the question which, um, which I think um, was mentioned by, by, by Guido Bortoni on how, how much regulation and when. Now, in the energy sector, we're bound to always have 
a significant amount of regulation in relation to natural monopolies, such as pipelines and, and networks. Um, but there are two areas where I believe that there is an inevitable transition in, a, in the process. Uh, one is, if you're having to control the conduct of uh, incumbents, ultimately speaking, as you create the capacity for new entrants, um, then it should be possible to lighten that regulation and uh, allow competition authorities and uh, to, to play the key role in policing what's going on without, um, uh, without um, that, that being the subject of price of, of regulation from either the Commission or indeed the national regulators. And of course, in France and elsewhere, uh, there are plenty of voices which say, uh, well, prices of energy haven't gone down, therefore your liberalization is a, is, is a failure. Uh, and we continually point out the reason why they haven't gone down is most of them are still regulated. So, and that comes back to Inge, Inge, Inge Bernhardt's point, uh, you, you can't talk about liberalization until you've actually liberalized. And um, uh, in, in, those, in, those, in those markets where consumer organizations complain to us, they say, well, what are you going to do about it? And, and that's what uh, invest, uh, uh, energy companies say to us too. Let us compete, and then we'll be able to offer services to consumers at the retail level, which makes sense. The other, the other area where, of course, regulation has to be regularly reviewed is where you're pursuing a public policy objective like climate change, which implies support to renewables, encouraging producer-consumer um, uh, mod uh, business models. Um, uh, surely we have to uh, have a trajectory here which recognizes the gradual um, advantages which can be gained from rollout of renewable technology. And at a certain point, we have to say it's Schluss. And that there isn't a permanent expectation that every new technology should be the subject of favorable regulation and favorable, um, and, and favorable um, uh, access or favorable price. Ultimately speaking, there must be some clock ticking to make sure that we return to a situation of normal uh, commercial activity and innovation without subsidy. That's not without subsidy to research and, research and development and innovation, but the rollout of products on the market and services on the market should surely with not require on a permanent basis um, subsidy. Um, the mac make makers of traditional vacuum cleaners didn't receive subsidy. Uh, the, the, ma the maker of the new uh, dustless uh, uh, vacuum cleaner didn't have a permanent feed-in tariff for his vacuum cleaner. Uh, that's what I'm getting at. Thank you. Uh, there is a question here, third row. And then I will take another one, and, and we will have to. Um, sorry for all the hands which are raising. Uh, Please. Thank you, uh, Gunnar Lundberg, Chairman of your Electrics Markets Committee. It's, I'm a little bit astonished that we have eight representatives in the panel, and all of them saying that we are on the right track, the market is on its way, we will meet uh, the Council's goal 2014. But is that really the truth? I think 600 years ago it was not risk-free to say in this room that uh, the Earth is a globe. You could be in deep trouble if you said that in this room 600 years ago. And, but I hope it's risk-free to say that we are not on the track in the market. What we see is that, that uh, subsidies to renewables destroys not just the market price but also the price on carbon because we are decarbonizing for a cost of more than 100 euro per ton with offshore wind and other things when the market price on carbon is less than 10 euro. Uh, we are seeing that uh, market integration doesn't work because transmission system operator and power exchanges cannot cooperate. We have heard in the groups of uh, IESAG and AHAG earlier that next meeting we will see an agreement between them how they will do this. But it's not happening, and it will, we will probably not see anything in the 
Florence Forum two weeks from now. What is happening? Are we on the wrong institutional level? Do we need one European TSO, one European power exchange to make it happen? Because if these all institutions cannot cooperate, are we really making it possible? So, I mean, I would have expected a little bit more serious discussion in the panel about the real problems, because it is not for sure that we are on the track. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I, am, I am very anxious because I suspect that uh, answering your question would need uh, a full session. And we, ha we are two minutes for, from the end. Uh, I don't know whether somebody, w uh, Mr. Potoshnik, well, tried guess. to summarize in one minute what well, we... <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you're right, because otherwise we would stay here for the whole day. Uh, no, Gunnar, I think I sort of see your point that you know, not everything is perfect. But I don't think, I think we are making progress. I mean, if you look at back over the last couple of, I mean, three years, you know, four years, now we know where we need to go. Since last December, we have also agreed um, um, roadmaps to get there. Um, yes, the, 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 the path is not smooth, and every month, you know, there is a hiccup, something coming up. I spend a lot of my time writing to TSOs, to regulators, sort of urging them to sort of push the process ahead, etc. But at least now we have. Um, I think that there is a sense of common purpose. I think there is a roadmap. At least we know if we are late. Something that until recently we didn't know. And in fact, as you know, we've been discussing, you know, we've been around 20 years trying to achieve this. I don't think that a lot of time has been wasted. This is a very complex um, uh, project. And uh, I think, you know, we, it won't be, you know, it's not in 2014 we will have the job done and then have um, you know, go on holiday. I think this will be a continuous project. But I think now we have everything, all the ingredients there. And I agree with you, sometimes we have disagreement among uh, stakeholders, among participants. But at least now we have the tools in place. And if we can get this voluntarily and in parallel as we're doing it now, very soon we'll have it through the network codes. But I think it's best for everyone if we try to put this effort together now and do it. So yes, it's not perfect, but the world is never perfect. But I think now we're in a much better play, uh, position than ever before to try to do it. Thank you. I think that Philip wants to have a one-minute answer, too. Right. It will be one minute. The, half, the glass is half full and half empty, of course. Um, but the reason, the reason why I believe that we can put fuel back into the tank and get this done and make it work uh, is that I, I think we keep forgetting why we started off on this. We kept forgetting the fundamental reasons why we're in this. We were in renewables because we were convinced that it was necessary to bring costs down by large-scale rollout of renewables from a level of only 2% of energy consumption to 20%. It makes sense to support renewables in that, in that context. However, in 2020, if we get to the point of actually meeting the target, the arguments when we've actually got wind, uh, off onshore wind and, uh, and, and solar already with costs coming dramatically down, the arguments for continuing that same regime are much more fragile. There must be a degressivity of subsidy in relation to, uh, in, in relation to costs. And of course, yes, um, uh, uh, my commissioner and I regret many times the number of stakeholders it has to, we have to bring together in order to make something work. And um, uh, I think that market players realize that too, and that it would be um, eminently um, uh, desirable in some areas that there would be a concentration, a further concentration of economic activity in certain sectors. I'm not talking about DSOs and TSOs as a whole, one is not possible, but a certain degree of confidence in a business model which works across frontiers in several markets seems to be a good thing, and it will drive the process, and it will mean that the regulators don't have to drive the process as much as they do today. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Dobeni. Just 
just uh, a few words. <clears throat> Your point, Gunnar, reminds me of, of uh, 2005, 2006, when uh, a certain number of partners tried to uh, put together the idea of market coupling between the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. At that time, I think all parties were against the idea. And I heard so many people saying that it would fail, that this would not be the solution, that there were so many other solutions. So criticism is easy, but I would much prefer that all parties concerned try to find out how to help solving issues today in order to happen, to make it happen tomorrow. Thank you very much. I'm looking I'm at, uh, at my watch and I think uh, we have to stop there. Let me uh, take the privilege of chairing this session to give myself the last minute. And I think that uh, this was an extraordinary interesting session. There is perhaps one word which is missing or at least uh, we have not emphasized enough which is flexibility, the need for flexibility. And I would like to explain that for two reasons. The first one is that we have not at all addressed uh, the issue of technical progress. We have discussed as if uh, the technical picture was as it is right, right now and would stay in the future. Uh, well, I'm not sure it is true. Uh, what will be the market design if there is a very strong decrease in the costs of some renewables? What will be the market design if uh, we make a, a breakthrough progress in uh, electricity storage? What will be the market design if we make a tremendous program in uh, transmission uh, with supraconductivity. It's not tomorrow, it's maybe the day after tomorrow. And that does not mean we don't have to do anything, but we have to keep flexibility possible. And the second reason, which I think was uh, well shown in our debate, e even if sometimes implicitly, is that if everybody agrees that we need an internal market as soon as possible uh, and, and uh, uh, that it means much more coordination uh, between operators, much more uh, connections uh, between countries, etc., I think that we have to realize that the conditions today are not exactly the same as the ones which prevailed uh, uh, when the market design was elaborated 20 years ago. At that time, the general perception was that there would be a convergence towards a common energy mix inside the EU. Today, We'll know, we know that it is the exact opposite, that there will not be any energy mix and perhaps increasingly less convergence uh, between the different energy mixes. Uh, at that time, uh, we thought energy efficiency would result of the market forces. Now we know that we need very strong public policies to implement uh, very demanding targets, demanding goals for uh, energy efficiency. Uh, at that time, uh, the intermittency of renewables was not a problem just because the share of renewables was so small. Now we know that it becomes a very strong problem and the market design is not so far fit to uh, addressing this very specific issue. And I could uh, go on. That means, in my view, that we have to hope and to work for much more uh, strength in achieving the internal market as soon as possible. But at the same time, that is not contradictory, 
to keep it open to perhaps modified the market design as it was uh, decided some years ago and to take into account what is new. And I was in agreement with almost everything what Philippe said. Perhaps the slight point of disagreement is that I think that that means this market is not a market as any other one and that probably we will need a strong regulatory regulation for a very long time. Now, I thank you very much. I thank you for your patience, and I give back the floor.